With Nintendo 3DS and Wii U servers gone, is it still possible to go online? AI features are heading to more Samsung Galaxy phones than expected. Sony rattling the skull with its newest headphones. A live action Monopoly movie is on the way. World of Warcraft returns to China. And dozens of popular podcasts find a new home. This and a whole lot more taking over the headlines of the past in a few days. I'm Jason Grewa, and this is The Fresh Wire. Hey everyone, hope you're all doing well, and welcome to another episode of The Fresh Wire, and it's maybe a shorter one than usual. I want to get back to the rhythm of doing these on Friday nights, so that's why, exactly why it's on a Friday night. Hope you're all doing well, like I said just a few seconds ago. A lot has happened in the past few days, surprisingly, or maybe unsurprisingly. I'll get into a few topics that I won't dive into too much, but first off, I understand something called the Humane AI Pin just released, and I went to some reviews, and it is unbelievable something like that can release. I understand the company said it's a first-gen product, and they're trying to improve it every day, but the whole concept of this AI Pin is exactly the name. It's a pin that you put onto your shirt or jacket or whatnot, and you just hold your finger onto it if you want to say any sort of command. Apparently, this is a mixture of different chat GPT equivalent chat models all I guess combine them in some sort of fashion to give you an AI assistant that is convenient and meant to be mostly screenless the screen actually is a, something that projects onto your hand and is not meant to be used for more than it seems to be a few minutes a lot of issues including overheating and lackluster battery life it hasn't seemed to have been very successful, and it's all the problems of a first-gen product, and then some, especially because it seems to not just be a first-gen product of its kind, but a very early AI product. And for the price, $700 and 24 a month, that seems to be mandated. It's a, it's a no-go, obviously. I'm not interested in anything like that. I'll just stick to the chat assistants that are built in or available on my lovely little smartphone. So that was one of the biggest ones. I'm not going to dive into, of course. Now, one thing I have to get into before anything else further is a huge passing away that happened in recent days. And I think you probably know which one I'm talking about. O.J. Simpson, former NFL star broadcaster, the one who was in the infamous uh, 1994 chase involving the brutal killings of his ex-wife and uh, her friend, in the 1995 trial that acquitted him, uh, died of cancer. His family announced Thursday on X. He was 76 years old. So, obviously, I have to mention this. He had a big impact when he played for the uh, NFL Buffalo Bills. He participated in some commercials for Hertz, some films for the Naked Gun franchise, and, of course, everything changing when he was part of a trial that charged him of murder for his ex-wife, Nicole Brown Simpson, and her friend Ron Goldman. So, of course, it was a huge monumental trial, sometimes called the trial of the century, from the chase to the acquittal. I was not alive for these, so I don't have the personal experience. And then, of course, he went on maintaining his innocence. Eventually, more people started to believe he was guilty. He released the book saying, if I did it, I don't. This is obviously a very controversial person that has now passed away. As part of my podcast, I have to mention when someone very large and impactful, whether they were in the entertainment industry or at least close to it, or just had a huge impact on everyone, I got to mention my podcast. Uh, My condolences go to his family. Of course, this is probably a very difficult time for them, Um, especially for um, the children that probably, you know, that just lost their father. So my condolences go to uh, go to them and yeah I'm not gonna go further into it because of the controversy that surrounded him I hope that the people involved the people related to Nicole Brown Simpson and Ron Goldman have them remained in their thoughts and um, for the rest of their lives one of the first topics I want to dive into is a big one so in recent days specifically Monday which speaking of hope everyone enjoyed the partial or total solar eclipse that went over the United States and parts of Canada. Hope you all enjoyed that. I did. I, of course, had a partial eclipse. 
and it was it was an experience. It was it was cool to have. Obviously, I didn't look right into it. I didn't have Eclipse glasses, but I was able to take a photo of it, and it looks pretty nice. Admittedly, in some angles, it just kind of looks like a partial moon or crescent moon, but whatever. It won't happen again for another 20 years or so. And at that point, I think it's only going to be over two U.S. states anyway. Anyway, but something else happened Monday. Monday evening specifically, Nintendo followed through with what they said they were going to do a long time ago and have shut down the Nintendo network, specifically online service for the Wii U and Nintendo 3DS. Obviously a big deal. They've shut down. Now, I can't confirm that this is actually fully gone for good, but the spot pass servers that were infamous with the 3DS and were actually a pretty big deal um, because of the fact it really felt like your 3DS was always connected. It's the reason why when I was 12, I wanted the 3DS so bad. It was just so such an extraordinary handheld, and I was lucky to get one for my 12th birthday. Unfortunately, it was stolen within the next year, but then I got another one, and then a few years later, I got the new 3DS, and that's what I've been holding on to since from 2016 or so. I also had a Wii U, but it's been it's been deep in my archives for years now. It hasn't seen the live day since probably 2017 or 2018. Sorry, I mean, Nintendo Switch. But there was actually a pretty big effort to archive a lot of data because a lot of data was actually only accessible through the online servers and not just something that's just easily archivable, but, for example, Capcom before the shutdown had to say if you wanted to download any extra data like quests or I think accessories or pets or whatnot, you had to go in to the Monster Hunter games on 3DS and Wii U and just download them all because there was no easy way to access them even if you already downloaded them and just deleted them because they required an internet connection to reach them in any capacity. Once they were downloaded, it's no problem. But that was a big thing, and not just that, but spot pass. A lot of spot pass data that was easily accessible over the internet and for years and years. Well, now, as far as I know, they're supposed to be all gone. Now, I did see in a Discord server that they don't seem to be away just yet, at least as of a few days ago, so after the supposed shutdown. But there was a big effort to archive all this data for spot pass. It was a spot pass archival project. And yeah, I participated in it, and it felt a little good. It also felt good that I opened up my 3DS for the first time in a long time. Unfortunately, I lost the charger, but it had just enough battery left for me to go through, download whatever for the Monster Hunter games, and then just a little bit of online action. Specifically, I opened up Street Fighter IV, one of the first games I ever owned for the 3DS, including my first one, so back in 2011. Well, long time ago. And I played one match, and unfortunately, I lost. Then I jumped into Mario Kart 7, and I played only two races, because, again, didn't have much battery life, and I lost my charger a long time ago. And luckily, I did not do well in the first race, and I got first place in the last race, my last online interaction, official online interaction. Let me explain. In recent months, there's been a push for this third-party solution for Wii U and 3DS services called Pretendo. And what it allows it is it's sort of an open source substitute to the Nintendo network. In other words, if it's when it's finished, it will allow a large amount of 3DS and Wii U games to function again online with some hacking and modifications. Now, luckily, it's very easy to hack a Wii U and 3DS nowadays, and with online services shut down, it can be all but certain, hopefully I'm not jinxing it, that patches are unlikely to be released. So, while with 3DS and Wii U, before the server shut down, you needed to hack both of those, and like I said, it's pretty easy. I've done it. It was one of the first things I did with my new 3DS back in 2016, and my second 3DS I ever owned, I also hacked. Very easy. Um, Not to pirate, of course, but for extra modifications. I never did it with my Wii U because for the longest time you actually had to purchase a game to exploit it. And by the time they released, I think, a free solution or web browser-based solution, I, my Wii U was in the archives. But now, if you don't want to hack your Wii U, but you want to run Pretendo, now you can. 
There's been a workaround that was found rather a while back, but was revealed right after the official server shut down that allows you to get limited access to the Pretendum network without needing any sort of custom firmware, which is one of the big things about hacking your 3DS or Wii U. The custom firmware allows you to really dive deep into the workings of those devices. Some restrictions still apply because the main thing is that because of this exploit found using the own uh, server's own SSL, or I think Secure Socket Layer, which is some... It involves changing the DNS and the internet settings for the Wii U, as long as your firmware version is the at least the second to newest one, which would be 5.5.5, then it actually functions. Now, of course, it won't run everything. Only a DNS change can only do so much. Third-party titles, for example, that use their own SSL will not function with just the DNS change, and you would have to actually hack your Wii U and implement the Pretendo online implementation yourself for those sort of titles to eventually work if they aren't already. But it's actually a pretty crazy deal. All you can, all you have to do is change your DNS server or DNS setting, and you have online as if nothing happened. Now, I think one thing to note is. The sign-in process, now of course, the Nintendo Network being shut down, I think you would have to create a new account, if not something with a new username. Now, of course, if you manually install Pretendo with a custom firmware, I don't think that's at least as much of an issue. Same for the 3DS. But that is something to keep in mind for the Wii U. But it's extraordinary that for the Wii U, you can come back online just with a DNS change. That's insane. Now, for 3DS, like I said, it's so easy to modify. I'm not sure about the Wii U. I think it's gotten easier as well, but it's impressive that this was figured out, and Godspeed to Pretendo and everyone that works on it. I mean, there's works, there's uh, developments going for a Miiverse uh, alternative or replacement for 3DS and I think Wii U that they're still working on. Um, and I think something called Juxtaposition that involves the Pretendo servers. There's a lot going on. It's The homebrew community for 3DS and Wii U is alive and well, and I am thankful for that. If I ever want to get back into 3DS um, gaming, because there's so many great games on the 3DS and Wii U, I'm thankful that there is still a thriving community that's still out there. I, to a degree, I, I have to say, an honorable mention, uh, the PlayStation Vita, as well by Sony, which was... which died too soon, ironically because of its name, but it still has, I think, a somewhat thriving homebrew community. Every now and then I check for updates with my Vita uh, on homebrew applications, and some of them do get updates, so there's still a community there. It's just, understandably, the online services for the Vita are officially are still active. Oh, it's not a big break point for that just yet. For 3DS and Wii U, they sold multiple times more, the 3DS specifically, the Wii U was actually close to the Vita in sales, but 3DS sold multiple times more, so multiple times more people available to go all out with their handheld, and yeah, like I said, I can't stress it enough, I'm thankful that these people are really putting themselves forward. Now, onwards to a small section f focused on podcasts. Now, first thing I want to mention is the Roost Podcast Network. So Rooster Teeth, which held this podcast network that holds a lot of different podcasts, including the H3 podcast, which is a pretty big one. Well, Warner Bros. Discovery shut down Rooster Teeth, but now in recent days, they've confirmed that they've sold what was probably the most valuable asset, the podcast network, the Roost. So now it's been acquired by influencer talent agency Knight, which I think deals with Mr. Beast. And a funny connection between them, the president of Knight, Ezra Cooperstein, was also the president of Rooster Teeth from 2018 to 2019. So I'm glad all those podcasts have found a new home, especially under an agency as big as this one if it deals with Mr. Beast. So good for them. A bunch of different, I think the Philip DeFranco show is also another one. Uh, I think The Yard, which has a famous uh, Ludwig uh, live streamer. So, big deal there, and I'm glad they're going to be able to move forward, hopefully with minimal changes, or if any, positive ones. Now, with Spotify, it looks like a big feature 
that has been in the making for literally years could finally be coming soon. Lossless audio. Unfortunately, it looks like it will not be free. Reportedly, it looks like it's going to be part of what's called the Music Pro add-on. It was found in code snippets in a recent build of Spotify for Android, which infamously is very easy to get into what it's called APK, or rather the downloads or apps themselves before they're actually installed. It seems to be pretty easy to dive deep into them, as I've seen before in a lot of articles that look into new updates for the Google app and whatnot and seeing some crazy new features that could be on the way soon. So three years ago, Spotify Hi-Fi was what it was known to be part of what was called the Supremium subscription tier. And it looks like this possibility being teased, it's finally coming, the long-awaited lossless audio. It'll be allegedly included in what's called the Music Pro add-on. And it could also include the DJ Remix features, which are pr also pretty interesting. Those will let Spotify subscribers tinker with tracks in a whole new way. So this isn't a new plan. Again, I think I mentioned last week that Spotify is actually expected to raise the price for their normal tier, but, but offer one that doesn't have the audiobooks for the price it's at now. But it looks like now, rather than offering a higher-end tier, they're going to offer an add-on. So Reddit user trudging through the code to piece together the plans that Spotify has, the mentions of Lossless are very direct, including one snippet saying Lossless has arrived, so they're really hyping this up. Also saying Spotify will support, quote, up to 24-bit slash 41 uh, sorry, 44.1 kilohertz, unquote, FLAC files, which is pretty good. That's like, I think, above the CD quality. I think CD quality is 16-bit. So a little higher, but um, not sure. Also, it seems to be that they're planning some kind of headphone optimization feature that uses, quote, patented technology, unquote, to enhance sound for specific models, Apple's AirPods specifically getting a mention in the code. Music Pro also could allow more advanced library filtering. And of course, with this big push into AI playlists, it's unknown if Music Pro could go even further. Now, I don't wanna pay more, so that's gonna be a little unfortunate because I would love to have higher quality audio. And it'll be a shame that after all these years with all these other plans like Tidal and um, I think Amazon, I know for sure Apple, are all just including this lossless audio as part of their basic plans, if not all their plans. And it's really annoying that Spotify, one of the most popular ones, is just going to include it as an add-on, which is the equivalent to higher-end higher end plan anyway. Now onwards to a little bit of, you know what you love it, disappointment. Now, I know I just talked about Nintendo before, and it's not a good thing Nintendo did, shutting down online servers for devices that people still could use from time to time. Remember, after the Wii U and 3DS, Nintendo combined the handheld and home console into the Nintendo Switch. A massive success. I think more successful than the PlayStation 4. Quote me if I'm wrong. But, of course, they've been in some hot water because of the whole fiasco between the Yuzu Nintendo Switch emulator and Nintendo itself. And now, Discord is stepping in and making themselves look ugly as well, because as I mentioned, they are trying to really torpedo their reputation first by adding a form of advertisements into their product, albeit it's free, so not too surprising, but it's still annoying after all these years. And now they're going a bit further by shutting down the Discord servers for the new Nintendo Switch emulators, Suyu and Sudachi, also disabling the lead developers' accounts questions were not being answered by Discord, and it's a bit of an intriguing thing considering Suyu and Sudachi began as forks of Yuzu, the emulator that Nintendo sued out of existence back in March. Originally, the developers only received vague messages until the Discord director of product communications said in a statement, Discord responds to and complies with all legal and valid DMCA requests or Digital Millennium Copyright Act. In this instance, there was also a court-ordered injunction for the takedown of these materials, and we took action in a manner consistent with the court order. Now, it's unclear what exactly is being part of this DMCA request. The developers only received, like I said, vague messages about how they were sharing content that allegedly violates intellectual property rights. 
Discord says it's following its normal process for DMCA takedown requests. Not at all clear that there was a valid DMCA takedown request or that these communities were actually violating IP rights. And it's quite possible Discord is not following its own policy by kicking them out. Now, a little bit of context about the whole Nintendo Yuzu situation. It didn't go to court. Nintendo was able to get the developers of Yuzu to just settle rather than proving its case. So it did not give Nintendo the rights to Yuzu's freely copyable, copyable code. Developers of the forks of Yuzu, which by the way, forks mean branching out and creating your own iteration of available code. The developers claim they were changing the code further in an effort to avoid upsetting Nintendo again. Code wasn't even hosted on Discord. So of course it's possible on these servers, now that they're gone, it's harder to prove that maybe Nintendo information or even pirated games were being shared around in the servers. With the servers gone, it's unclear how that if that could ever be proven. Now, even if they were infringing, the policy of Discord doesn't suggest it would permaban or even nuke entire servers on the first offense. Discord is not willing to answer further questions about any other specifics, including the takedown requests and if these were repeat copyright infringers, if this was a first if this was a first offense or not. Now, of course, if it's not a first offense and they went with this, uh, if it was a first offense rather, and they went with this, it is bypassing or defying Discord's own policy, which is a very, very ugly, ugly thing to put themselves into. Um, the developer of Sudachi says their first email from Discord was that the account broke the TOS terms of service with no additional information and then was vaguely told it had something to do with intellectual property, but Discord did not provide any other details. So it's obviously a very weird situation. Of course, Discord being its own company does has no obligation to host anything they don't want to host. But it's very, very intriguing on why this could have happened. And for Sudachi, the developer for that emulator says that he's still going to work on his projects. But for some Suyu developers, this could have been the last straw. Here's a bit of a specific detail. An insider says after infighting, one group has splintered off to do its own projects, which may or may not be related to emulation. A real Suyu developer in a pace bin claims the core development team has left the project because of Suyu's, quote, radioactivity, unquote, and its allegedly egotistic leader. There is that. Very intriguing. Uh, very disappointing by Discord. Um for them to do this with no correct explanation. Everything they said defies their own policy. So very disturbing behavior, admittedly, even if they want to cover their butt in case Nintendo were to go round two with these forks or different iterations of the code they attempted to take down. Um, still a very disturbing act for them to not even, um, not even try to double down. They just did it and disappeared. Moving on to adding more advertisements to their platform. Very lovely. And speaking of other disappointing news, uh, Google decided for everyone that has Google One, their paid subscription, you're going to get screwed over just a tiny bit. The VPN that was offered to Google One users is being shut down officially. I even got the email myself because I'm a Google One subscriber as well. I have the two terabyte premium plan, so probably the best value plan you could actually get. It rolled out in October 2020, and the only explanation is that the VPN service we discontinued later this year. Now, it was in recent months that Google One's VPN started to be available. It used to be available for plans as low as $10 a month, brought down to $2 a month to get Google One VPN, which is actually a pretty great deal for a VPN that seems to have been pretty reliable and pretty reputable. The company telling 9to5Google it's killing the service because, quote, people simply weren't using it, unquote. Now, admittedly, it was something I didn't use myself. I gladly play, uh, pay for private internet access. Uh, fantastic VPN. I've been using it for years whenever I have to, whenever I want to um, look at websites, for example, in a different country or continent and whatnot. And, of course, to protect my privacy whenever I feel like it. 
And it's actually a pretty great price too, although I do pay yearly just to do for Google One. Now, from what I see, it could be that they may be focusing more on Gemini AI efforts. And the email I got is actually pretty funny because it kind of just is a negative Nancy for Google One users. I don't know why they were so adamant on pissing off their own subscribers. I actually have the email right here. It says updates to your Google One membership. And here's what it explains in its key changes. They're specifically saying that they're expanding access to the popular features that made Google One successful. Editing features in the Google Photos app will now be available to all, specifically Magic Eraser and Portrait Light, which is pretty cool, along with dark web reports that will be available to all eligible Google accounts in the coming months. I actually use it and actually found some pretty insane stuff that is on me on the dark web. So props to that. Uh, Magic Editor is also coming to more people starting in May. The only benefit to this Magic Editor being available is if you're a Google One member with a premium 2 terabyte or above plan, like me, I'll have unlimited saves in Magic Editor to unlock your creativity. So there is that. Funny enough, this actually doesn't explain that they're... Oh, no, I see it now. So the two benefits that they're phasing out... Which, okay. Um, free shipping for select print orders from Google Photos and starting on May 15th and the VPN later this year. So they pretty much said... We're making a lot of what made Google One so good available to everyone, but don't worry, we're taking away some stuff too. So, not a great thing. They're saying, oh, but the Magic Editor will be available uh, with unlimited saves um, if you're able to support it. I'm not sure how far out it's going to go. I would love to have something like that because from what I see, it's extraordinarily capable of very good use of AI, and I'm... Hopeful I get access to that soon because I want to play around with it. It looks pretty cool moving stuff around and removing it. And it, I, I'm excited to use that. And limited saves is pretty nice. I'm not sure what the restriction is going to be. But I don't know. It's very disappointing to just lose functionality, keep it at the same price, and then promote that some of the best things about Google One is coming out to everyone. That's just great. Um, but I can't be mad. More people will be have will be able to have access to cooler and greater features without having to pay a penny, and I, I can only respect that. What I can't respect, like I said earlier, with Discord implementing advertisements, Microsoft seems to be joining the fun. Windows 10 infamously having ads in its start menu, like app recommendations, and now Windows 11 will too. So Microsoft says they're going to use the recommended section of the start menu which usually shows file recommendations, to suggest apps from the Microsoft Store. They say in a blog post, this will appear only for Windows Insiders on the beta channel in the U.S. and will not apply to commercial devices or devices managed by organizations. Now, actually, can I see it myself? Funny enough, I'm on the beta, actually, for Windows 11, so I can vouch to say that I do not see it on my end. It could be that maybe I'm not up to date or I may have some program here and there that may be blocking this sort of telemetry, uh, tele telemetry, sorry, I'm saying that wrong. Um, and I just checked for updates and no, nothing. So very intriguing. Uh, also for context, last year Microsoft started testing ads inside the File Explorer for Windows 11 before disabling that experiment in beta version. So not super surprising considering this was already a thing back in Windows 10. And it is unfortunate, but like I said, not surprising. Again, I don't see it on my end, and I am running the latest beta, as far as I know, for Windows 11. So for me to not see it, either I modified something so that sort of information is not accessible, or that area is not accessible, or it's just rolling out over time. It seems to be that the app promotions can be disabled in the settings section of Windows 11, but it appears that Microsoft will enable these by default. So... It could be that I may have just turned them off without even realizing it. Um, actually, I take all that back. I just found it. Show recommendations for tips, shortcuts, new apps, and more actually in the start section under personalized. So let me see what happens if I turn that off. And it is no different. So I think for my safety, I'm going to keep it off. 
I don't see a reason to have that on. Actually, I, I don't even see this. You could turn on more pins rather than the default where it's a mixture of pins and recommendations. You can also do more recommendations. I don't know why you would do that, but that's a pretty cool feature, and I'm actually going to keep that on. So thank you, Microsoft. You ironically made it even harder to get recommended. Thanks. Pretty ambitious SD card seems to be on the way next year. Four terabyte SD cards. Four terabytes. Some of you may be owners of lovely hard drives that may be four terabytes or more. I have, I think, a 16 terabyte hard drive for my Plex server, hosting all sorts of over-the-air movies and uh, ripped Blu-rays uh, and TV shows and whatnot. And now, I mean, they're bulky. They're hard drives. This being in a small little card, four terabytes is an insane amount. At the NAB show this week, Western Digital previewed its 4 terabyte SD card, saying it won't be available until next year. And it seems to have enough of a minimal sequential write speed for 8K video recording. At this price, I would hope so. Now, for context, right around now, the 1 terabyte version of this SD card retails for around $140. So it's a possibility it could be several hundred dollars or more back in 2018 the sd association announced the secure digital ultra capacity card specifications saying that sd cards could hold up up to 128 terabytes of storage that's insane in something as small as that maybe when i have a family with kids maybe we'll see 128 terabytes otherwise that's we're not even seeing that in hard drives or uh mainstream available storage in general so i don't see that happening anytime soon we may be in the low 20s for commercial hard drives hard drives to put emphasis on that so I'm not sure about us but that would be cool one day speaking of cool for the kids and whatnot uh, sony unveiled some new headphones and speakers with a big push on the bass that's right bass they introduced a new brand called ULT Power Sounder, I guess Alt, which is admittedly a big deal because Sony infamously has a problem naming a lot of their stuff, specifically their headphones and earphones. I think mine is the WF-1000XM5. I think that's what it is, the headphones. No, not WF. WM, I think, 1000XM5s. They're extremely good headphones. I just call them the XM5s, and they are outstanding quality. Their active noise cancellation is unbelievably, it's, it's extraordinary. They were a great price. I bought them on a discount, and I highly recommend them if you want some premium audiophile headphones. They have great Bluetooth. They have a headphone jack, which is fantastic. It comes with the aux cord. Just overall great. And they introduced new ones, and one of them actually is pretty impressive. First off, they announced something called the Alt Tower 10, a $1,200, 64-pound party speaker. It lights up, it syncs to your music, microphone for karaoke, and some new sound modes. The Alt button, uh, Alt 1 gives you, quote, deeper, lower frequency bass. Alt 2 delivers, quote, powerful punch. So... Sony used to have something called the extra bass mode, and I guess you could take this as the next generation of that. If you want something a little cheaper, the Alt Field 7 is $500 and looks to be an extraordinary premium Bluetooth speaker that's also a bit big. It measures over 20 inches wide. It does have integrated handles, decent battery life. It's IP67 uh, dust and water resistant. And Sony says it has a rust-proof design. Now, if you want something actually portable, the $129 Alt Field 1, which comes in several different colors, only has a single Alt sound mode and slightly weaker battery life, 12 hours of continuous listening. And you can even use it as a speaker phone and even has a built-in strap, so you could put it right onto your bag. Now, I have the JBL... I have some JBL speakers... I think they're the Flip 6, and they're actually pretty good. I have two of them because of their stereo connectivity, which is pretty nice. So there is, of course, the big thing is the headphones. The Alt 
Wear. Sony's new mid-tier noise-canceling wireless headphones, which supposedly, Sony says, uh, will have a lot of features carried down from its premium headphones. The XM5s, like I said, I have. On-ear detection, upgraded noise cancellation, head-tracking spatial audio, which should have the biggest asterisk in the world if you have a Samsung phone because it doesn't actually support it. Thanks, Samsung. I'm sure glad that the only spatial audio device that so actually supports the Samsung Galaxy phones is the Buds, uh, the Galaxy Buds, like the Buds 2 Pro. I own those, and they're fantastic as well. They're my go-to earphones, but of course disappointing. So these new headphones seems to have, to continue to have Sony's, some of Sony's best audio, uh, octave noise cancellation and sound. However, the company says these were specifically designed for deep bass response. So if you're a whole big fan of bass, if you want a whole lot of bass, all about that bass, and no trouble, these actually sound like a pretty good thing for 200 bucks. And they will begin shipping this spring. Specifically, the Power Sound products and the Old Field One is due sometime in the summer. So, pretty exciting stuff. Obviously, I'm not in the market for any of those. My speakers are more than enough, and my headphones are still phenomenal, especially because they remain as the flagship product for Sony's premium headphones. I'll stick with what I've got. Now, a little bit of entertainment, and this is actually a big deal. Monopoly movie. So, I may have mentioned before something about Margot Robbie and Lionsgate, and... I think it was something involving The Sims, but now they're going a little further. I may be wrong on that, but I do remember something about that being talked about. And now it seems like it's Monopoly's turn to also get a movie. It's going to be a live-action movie inspired by the board game. It's going to be in the works at Lionsgate, along with uh, Margot Robbie's Lucky Chap producing the film. This was reported by Variety, and this was warned. We were warned about this. Hasbro said... They've been warning for a while that it wants to kick off a full cinematic universe based on its toys and games. And when Barbie was a success, all bets were off. Now, it doesn't mean every film is going to be fantastic. Battleship, not too long ago, was a big flop. So it looks like this will probably take some time. Lionsgate film head expressed his confidence in Lucky Chap's, quote, clear point of view, unquote, on the Monopoly IP and excitement about the possibility of the game becoming another blockbuster for the production outfit. I don't know how that's going to end. I hope it doesn't end poorly for anyone involved. But I will keep some optimism. I liked Monopoly growing up. I think its video game adaptations have been a bit buggy from what I hear. Like save data issues and whatnot, especially with the Nintendo Switch version. But if it's well received... And it's live action, so I don't know how it's going to play out, like, at all. Same for The Sims, although I think that's animated. I don't remember. But I'm glad that it's being given an option. What's also what I'm glad is going to become an option again is World of Warcraft. No, not in the U.S. And no, it's not coming to Steam. Not yet. But for people in China. Last year, it was taken offline because a deal with Blizzard and Chinese publisher NetEase was not able to come to an agreement with a licensing feud. Well, they have reached to an agreement to return and restore some of the games that Blizzard has made, now owned by Microsoft, by the way. Just want to put that out there. And it's returning to China. Other titles that are also coming back is Hearthstone, StarCraft, Diablo, Warcraft, and Overwatch. Now, that's a big one. Huge fan of Overwatch. I'm glad more people are going to jump into it only to rage quit and be very toxic and being very, I'll just say, POS people and then uninstall the game and never come back to it again. And that is the cycle. It will continue forward till the day it, the game is shut down and replaced with Overwatch 3. But good for people in China to have more options in playing some. This is also a big one. I'm going to go into VR for just a little bit because this a huge update is on the way for people running, well, MetaQuest headsets, especially the MetaQuest 3. Now, a recent update suggested that there was not going to be this new laying down or lying down mode for the Quest 3 as they were still fine-tuning it to a degree. It used to be available in some sort of beta version last year and then was removed during that beta, but that's coming back for the Quest 3. That's not all. 
With version 64, a number of improvements was made to the pass-through quality on MetaQuest 3. It used to be a bit of an issue using your phone, for example, in pass-through, so while your headset is on, and that seems to have been improved. Color, exposure, contrast, and dynamic range have all been adjusted to more so match real-world surroundings. I saw a video of the comparison. I have yet to receive the update, and it is a huge difference. Finer details, for example, phone notifications and small texts on your smartphone will now be easier to actually read, so removing your headset is going to be much less needed. It's also less grainy in low-light conditions, so for that good old-fashioned late-night gaming in virtual reality, it's going to be easier. Sorry, mixed reality, because of the fact this matters. So, actually a pretty big deal. Also, other things implemented were external mic support. So now you can plug in an external microphone into the USB-C port on the Quest headset. Understandably a very big deal. And yes, lying down in MetaQuest 3 is going to be available in the version 64 update. In version 63, it was implemented for MetaQuest 2 and I think MetaQuest Pro. Also, one last thing they're adding seems to be called continuous casting. If you removed your headset while casting, it would stop the casting session. But now the mobile casting feature has been changed. So if you remove the headset, the stream will continue forward. So just make sure to stop casting when you're done. It will no longer be automatic. Now a bit of an AI before I go into future. A big push from Samsung to implement AI features into their latest and greatest smartphones, like the Galaxy S24, which released a few months back, was a big deal. It was one of the biggest changes involving the newest Samsung smartphone, AI, 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 with a big asterisk right at the end, or rather a very small one on purpose, saying it's only going to be free to the end of 2025. Then this big AI update came, for the most part, to Galaxy S23 users and the Galaxy S23 FE, which, if you don't know, uses the same processor and other hardware as Galaxy S22 flagship phones. Samsung earlier said that these AI features, at least for the most part, will not be going to the Galaxy S22, even though they were coming to the S23 FE. And they wouldn't specify other than hardware limitations and doubling down that it's just not coming to the S22. Then they hinted that they may be changing their mind and could actually bring more than anticipated. And that is exactly the case. Samsung is planning to bring select Galaxy AI features to older phones, including what seems to be the Galaxy S21 phones. That's pretty impressive. Now, it won't be all of them. So no instant slow-mo, for example, if you are using a smartphone from 2022, like the S22 Ultra, or the folding phones like the Z Fold 4 or the Z Flip 4. So, in other words, very similar to the lower-priced Galaxy S23 FE which was a very weird thing that really just made no sense. That it, that didn't even get all most of the features, and Samsung was still doubling down that the S22 was just going to get none of it. They've luckily changed that. So that's pretty impressive. Now, if you have the S21 phones, including the S21 Ultra, Fold 3, or Z Fold, uh, sorry, Z Fold 3 or Z Flip 3, two of the Galaxy AI features, Circle to Search and Magic Rewrite, which seems to be some sort of cloud-based generative AI feature will be heading to those phones as well. Now, I assume they're very cloud-based, which explains why they are coming to those phones and virtually no other feature from this big Galaxy AI push, all part of the One UI 6.1 update, which I think is coming to at least the S22 phones in May. So I can't wait for that. As a proud owner of the Galaxy S22 Ultra, I cannot wait for a lot of these features. I understand why Instant Slow Mo is not coming around. I can assume that's a really big local AI-based feature. But I'm glad it's at least... Uh, at least it's coming to some degree and not just going to be some small bug fix here. Not even for S21 users, which is fantastic. So for Futurology, I wanted to be a little laid back. I haven't done it really outside of AI for a while. And this is actually a pretty weird one. NASA has been asked to create a time zone for the moon. Why? Apparently, time ticks by faster on the moon relative to Earth. The difference is very small, but spaceflight needs extreme precision, hence this introduction, this want by the 
Biden administration in the U.S., a memo issued by the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy explained it, saying lunar spacecraft and satellites operate on an Earth-based time standard where difference of any sort of amount, even nanoseconds or microseconds, could create problems. This new lunar time zone called Coordinated Lunar Time could be a big push, a big focus on multinational missions to the moon. No focus of any sort of specific time zone rather than the moon. It would not be like a regular time zone on Earth, which go around the Coordinated Universal Time, or UTC. Remember, for example, if you're in New York, you probably go by UTC negative five. So five hours before the universal, the Coordinated Universal Time. Moon time passes 56 microseconds faster each Earth day due to the moon's lower gravity and its to Earth. So it's understandable why this sort of change is being put forward, whether or not it's going to be made or not. Well, this would require international agreements, so it's probably not going to happen anytime soon. I got this information, by the way, from a good old-fashioned NPR article. And, I mean, I'm pretty excited if they do something like that because it really pushes us forward into going back to the moon and, you know, something that I think we shouldn't have a huge focus on because of the fact we all still live on Earth, at least outside of a few groups of people that are on the International Space Station. But, uh, gotta have some priority, I guess. Some focus here or there, right? Maybe I'm wrong. But I've got a long way to go in the hopes of that we achieve something like that. And that's futurology. And that'll be it for the podcast. Thank you all for tuning in. I really do appreciate it from the top of my heart for everyone that does tune in. Thank you once again. I hope to fully return this back to Friday. That's why I'm doing this on Friday night to really put myself back into the rhythm of it. But that'll be it for me. Thank you again. Catch you all around. Until then, take care of yourselves and have a gosh darn good one. Have a good morning, afternoon, day, evening, or night, however you are, however you live. One thing I forgot to say, I'm recording this. It's 10.57 p.m. on April 12th, 2024. I had to slide that in. Got to do it sometime. Take care. Have a good one.